Terrorism is sweeping the world. Bombs are going off in places where they've rarely gone off in many years, such as Switzerland. Young people rioted in Switzerland this past summer, and the riots have continued into the fall. Barricades were erected in thriving commercial areas, and Molotov cocktails and rocks were thrown at stores. Such disturbances are almost beyond imagination to those of us who have often visited that tranquil and peaceful country. But dissatisfaction and irritation are strong among young people throughout the world. Emotions are running high on many issues in many countries, as the world seems to be moving, as the Japanese newspaper editorial said while we were there last month, toward a return to the dark ages. Perhaps at no time in history have the emotions of people been so fanned on a worldwide scale as they are today. Emotion seems to be in vogue in every phase of our lives, except in our experience of the Christian faith in many cases. Television stars use all of their powers to move the viewers, employing highly emotional sights and sounds to evoke feelings of sympathy, contempt, and passion in the hearts and minds of the audience. While we were in Japan recently, I watched several Japanese programs on television. Even though I could not understand the language, I saw that they too, like many other countries, have overemphasized sex and violence on television. Many of our writers use every device at their command to lead their readers into emotion-packed illusions and to create situations to stir the emotions of the readers. Politicians, as we've recently seen, leave no stone unturned in playing upon the emotions of their constituents in an effort to get votes for their campaigns. And even in our sports, the atmosphere in the stadium and ballpark is one of enthusiasm and super emotion. Who can imagine a football or a soccer match in which there is no cheering, shouting, and even sometimes rioting? However, in the most sensitive, vital areas of our lives, in our spiritual experiences, we are warned by some religious leaders that emotion has no place. When we started our evangelistic work, evangelism was considered too emotional. Therefore, we leaned over backwards in our crusades to have little or no emotion. There are no emotional outbursts of any kinds in our meetings. Thus, I'm far from being an advocate of cheap, shallow, contrived emotionalism in Christianity. However, I believe that the church has often inadvertently choked itself on dignity, decorum, and self-styled decency as the world has turned to its own devices for the emotional outlet that it craves by nature. Why is it that we're encouraged to feel deeply about sports, politics, entertainment, literature, art, and music, and not about religion? Why is it that when we choose a nominee for president, every string on human emotion is played, and yet when a man makes the greatest choice in life of choosing Christ as his savior, he is warned not to have emotion? While I've never subscribed to sensationalism, surface emotionalism, or fleshly religious demonstrations, I believe there's a need today for a return to heartfelt faith in Jesus Christ. In many parts of the Christian world, of course, they're going too far in emotion. There needs to be a balance. I've never told deathbed stories or emotional illustrations to work on the emotions of people. However, I believe that there is a sorrow that worketh to repentance, as it says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, and that people still need to be moved toward God. The word emotion comes from the Latin word novere, which means to move. It also carries the meaning of strong, deep feelings about any object, truth, or person. John Wesley said that the main text of the Church of England before the Wesleyan revivals in the 18th century had been, everything must be done decently and in order. But while the deteriorating Anglican Church was going through the meaningless, fruitless motions of decency and order in the 18th century, John Wesley, with a warm heart, was remaking a nation by preaching to the working masses and doing what God had ordered. His warm heart, his urging people to feel deeply about their faith in God, transformed the nation that had been drowned by dignity. Many people express the view that any display of emotion or sure feeling is a sign of weakness of character and is to be avoided at all costs. Jesus showed a variety of emotions. Among these emotions were anger, sorrow, grief, and joy. On two occasions, he wept openly and publicly, one when he stood by the graveside of Lazarus, another when he contemplated Jerusalem's fate and its rejection of him. 
our Lord displayed an extremity of grief and anguish of soul in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yet it is impossible to think of him as one who allowed his emotional life to get out of control. He never allowed danger to drive him into fear or panic. And on no occasion did he display anger or hasty words. A perfect underlying calmness and balance characterized Christ. He never displayed the indifference of stoicism on the one hand or the weakness of uncontrolled emotion on the other. He showed love and sympathy about sentimentality and anger without loss of temper. In his words and in his actions, he showed the poise and self-command of a perfectly balanced personality. A London psychiatrist says, emotions play a large and important part in normal mental function. They give tone and color to existence. Emotions give a stimulus to action. A man who feels strongly has an urge to do something about it. Emotions are the springboard of action. They lie at the base of much of our behavior and determine many of life's most important decisions. Two of these most important decisions of life are connected with marriage and a career. What sort of a marriage, especially in the Western world, would probably result if a man chose a girl on a purely intellectual basis without any emotional factors entering into his choice? When we use the expression falling in love, that implies an emotional experience. In choosing a career, psychology has found that although on the surface it may seem as though reason is the determining factor, in most cases, deeper analysis shows that instinctive and emotional causes lie behind the choice. Moses must have had deep moving feelings at the burning bush when he was consecrated by God to the task of delivering a nation from bondage. It must have been a moving experience to Isaiah when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and fell on his face and cried, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. David must have been deeply moved after he had sought and found forgiveness from the Lord as he sang, I will praise thee with my whole heart in the 138th Psalm. Peter, James, and John must have been stirred to the very depths of their souls when they stood with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and saw Christ in all of his glory talking with Elijah and Moses. Peter must have been deeply moved when he asked the Lord if they could stay there and build three tabernacles. Certainly the blind man must have been deeply stirred when he opened his eyes for the first time and with perfect vision looked into the face of Jesus. The Bible says that he went his way rejoicing, leaping, and shouting and praising God. Mary Magdalene would probably be considered emotionally unstable by many today because she came and broke a box of ointment and washed the feet of Jesus with her hair and tears. What a moving experience it must have been when Mary, Mary Magdalene and Salome, stood at the empty tomb and heard the angels say, He is not here, he is risen. How deeply the two must have been moved on the road to Emmaus when Jesus opened the scriptures to them. In talking about it later, they said, Did not our hearts burn within us? Where is the burning heart of people today? Where are the deep feelings of people about Christ today? Where are these feelings that will drive us into the highways, byways, and out into the streets to preach and testify concerning Jesus Christ or drive us to a foreign country if necessary to be a missionary? Certainly Saul of Tarsus must have been deeply moved when he was stricken on the Damascus Road. And hearing the voice of the Lord, he cried, What wilt thou have me to do? We cannot write Christianity off as a cold, calculating, creedal code that leaves no impact on the emotional nature of man. Christ touches our emotions, and our whole being throbs with the spiritual attributes of joy, love, peace, gentleness, meekness, and faith. The New Testament is a saga of high human emotions. Tears flow. Human joy runs high. Gladness surges like an artesian well, and praise springs from every page. Conversion is often preceded by emotional conflict in varying degrees of length and intensity. Conviction of sin and realization of the need for a savior may have an intellectual content founded on the teachings of scripture, but they also have an emotional content. Conversion is rarely as a result of cold intellectual reasoning, though it may sometimes be that. It is brought about by a feeling of regret and sometimes a feeling of guilt for the failures, sins, and shortcomings of the past and by a desire to find a solution to the emotional problems rending the soul. 
Many people condemn those who are preaching on the holiness, justice, and judgment of God. They say this is appealing to fear. In the dramatic story of the conversion of the Philippian jailer, the Bible says the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and threw himself down before Paul and Silas, trembling with fear because of an earthquake. This man had the emotion of fear dominating him at that moment. Many people would say that he was in no emotional state to be converted. Paul did not look at it that way. The man then and there received Christ as Savior, and the scripture says that Paul immediately baptized him. The scripture says that he had another emotion. The scripture says that he rejoiced with his whole household in his newfound faith in God. In other words, fear was the dominating emotion that brought him to Christ, and as soon as he came to Christ, it was supplanted by the emotion of joy and rejoicing. The emotions displayed at the time of conversion vary greatly according to the temperament, previous history, and circumstances of the convert. The Bible also teaches that the intellect and the will are deeply involved in conversion. The New Testament lays stress on the will, and its last appeal is to the will of man. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely, says Revelation 22:17. We are to know the truth revealed in the gospel message as well as to exercise our wills and experience emotion. There are many spurious conversions, of course, which are the result of an emotional crisis only. I recognize that. They are like the seed sown on stony ground which springs up and quickly withers away because it has no root. Oftentimes, however, we think because there has been much over-emotion in certain types of religious customs or perhaps on a religious television program that we should have no emotion and feeling in our faith at all. The faith by which we are saved is something far more than intellectual acceptance of doctrines and historical facts. It involves a will and emotion as well. There's a vast difference between cold, lifeless belief and a living faith. For Christian faith includes an emotional response to a living Christ and a personal relationship with him. Faith is confidence and trust in a person. It is possible to possess correct doctrine, to have an intellectual knowledge of the Bible, and yet to lack the power to live the Christian life. Emotions are often the driving power behind conduct, and knowledge by itself may leave a man's character untouched. Paul said that knowledge puffeth up, but love buildeth up. As believers in Christ, we should seek the middle path between a stoical, unemotional life on the one hand and a gushing emotional display on the other. We should be ready always to weep with those that weep and to rejoice with those that rejoice. We should, when necessary, be moved with compassion, just as our Lord was when he saw the multitudes scattered abroad as sheep without a shepherd. Sympathy demands emotion. Its very meaning, feeling with, implies this but we should never allow our emotions to gain control or to get out of control. Emotions are like a fire in the furnace. When contained, they are under control. The fire provides warmth for the entire house, but if it escapes from the control of the furnace, the fire's warmth quickly changes to burning and destruction. Our emotions must be under the control of the Holy Spirit, else we're in danger. Has your life been ruled by the law of passions and by sinful emotions? Has your emotional life been crushed and mutilated by the works of the flesh, such as adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, hatred, wrath, strife, drunkenness, revelings, as we find listed in Galatians, the fifth chapter? Christ has promised certain victory over these forces of your nature, which have perverted your emotions and made your moral struggle a spiritual stalemate. The Bible says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. For your hatred he will give you love. For your strife he will give you peace. For your depression he will give you joy. Christ does not erase our emotional nature. He transforms it and transcends it along with our wills and our reasons and fashions us into the image of himself, making us to live triumphantly in a world with an inward peace that is beyond human comprehension and understanding. I'm asking you today to have some feeling in your faith. I'm asking that you have so much feeling in your faith that you will start your Bible reading, prayer, faithful church attendance, witnessing for Christ, 
tithing to the work of the Lord. I'm asking you today to let your faith in Christ move you to a complete surrender and dedication of life and purpose to him. When Christ comes into the heart, he touches the entire man, the intellect, the emotion, and the will. He demands the surrender and consecration of our bodies as a living sacrifice unto him. Will you receive him today into your heart and let him touch the entire person? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that we may have this balance in our relationship to Christ, that our minds will believe on him, our hearts will sense his presence by the Holy Spirit, and our wills will be bent to his will. And we pray that our bodies will be presented as a living sacrifice to him. May we serve and follow him because in him only can we find the peace and the joy that perhaps we've been searching for all our lives. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. past week has been filled with screaming headlines throughout the world about the ominous dangers the world is facing. Three of our major news magazines this week devoted a great deal of space to the upheavals and turmoils from Vietnam through Southeast Asia, across India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, and Turkey, spilling into the northern part of Africa. There is great fear in the capitals of the world that the oil on which Japan and the Western world largely depend could be cut off. Airlines may not be able to fly around the world as they do now. Billions of dollars in business are at stake. President Carter is shown on the front cover of one magazine as juggling a dozen balls at the same time with a frantic look on his face. In addition, there's a military buildup of the Chinese on the Vietnam border. There is fear in Washington as well as Moscow that confrontation between the major powers may not be far off. In the meantime, new and more sophisticated armaments are being built by the major powers of the world. Last year, the world spent over one half trillion dollars on armament. We are told that there are over 3,000 nuclear missiles facing each other in Europe alone, and that in case of a major war, much of civilization will be wiped out. Certainly, we are living in apocalyptic times. In the midst of the problems, dangers, and dilemmas that the world is facing, what is the attitude of the Christian? What should be our attitude? During the years of the Second World War, the words of General Douglas MacArthur echoed in the ears of the people of the Philippine Islands while they were under enemy occupation. He had promised, I shall return, and he kept that promise. Jesus Christ has also promised, I shall return, and he will keep that promise. When I refer to the coming again of Christ and the future God is planning for the human race, a student at a university asked me, isn't this a form of escapism? I said, in a sense, yes. And before the devil gets through with this world, we're all going to be looking for the exit signs. C.S. Lewis, in his remarkable little book, Christian Behavior, said, Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we're to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven, said C.S. Lewis, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. In the midst of the pessimism, gloom, and frustration of the present hour, there is one bright beacon light of hope, and that is the promise of Jesus Christ. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. The whole nature of individual salvation rests squarely on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says, for by grace are we saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the Bible also teaches that the salvation of society, in the reordering of man's social institutions, consistent with the abol abolition of social injustice, war, poverty, and disease, will be taken out of man's hands someday. 
We're not going to achieve all this by education, evolution, politics, technology, military power, science. Nor will it be achieved by a universal church that can influence legislation in the congresses and parliaments of nations so as to produce such benevolent acts of men that all hate, evil, and sin will be abolished. The salvation of society will come about by the powers and forces released by the apocalyptic return of Jesus Christ. It will be instrumented through the kingdom of God in its principles of righteousness. It will be the prophesied fulfillment of redemption applied to every phase of human life and national existence. The second coming of Christ will be so revolutionary that will, it will change every aspect of life on this planet. Christ will reign in righteousness. Disease will be arrested. Death will be modified. War will be abolished. Nature will be changed. Man will live as it was originally intended that he should live. There's nothing on today's horizon or in contemporary thought that offers an alternate hope that is better. No arrangement of bad eggs will give you a good omelet. These successive civilizations of the past have been different arrangements of human institutions, but we've never had a lasting, satisfactory, peaceful social order. It is impossible to build a peaceful world on the cracked foundation of human nature. The importance of this hope of Christ's return is established by the frequency, extent, and intensity of its mention in the Bible. It is mentioned in all but four books of the New Testament. Christ constantly referred to his return, not only to his disciples, but others as well. One out of every 30 verses in the Bible mentions this subject. There are 318 references to it in 216 chapters in the New Testament. One twentieth of the entire New Testament deals with this subject. The hope of the second coming is found in the church's great creed, such as the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. Thus the Bible teaches it, the apostles preached it, and the church creeds affirm it. Over and over Jesus Christ said, the Son of Man shall come. They shall see the Son of Man coming, or your Lord doth come, or ye shall say, blessed is that that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hereafter ye will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Certainly a predicted event that was the subject of such universal and frequent attention and such great promise is a worthy object for our concern today. In the midst of a despairing, frustrated, trembling, confused, Armageddon-bound world, this is the hope that we have. There are three Greek words used in the New Testament to describe the coming again of Christ. The first one is parousia, which carries with it the idea of the personal presence of Christ. In other words, when Christ returns, he will come in person. The second Greek word is epiphania, which carries with it the idea of appearing. It is the appearance out of darkness of a star that has been there all day, hidden from view, and suddenly appearing at night. The third Greek word is apocalypsis, which carries with it the idea of unveiling. It is the unveiling of one who has been hidden. Today, the person of Christ is hidden from view, though his presence through the Holy Spirit is in our hearts. Today is the day of faith. In that day, he will be revealed. In that day of his coming, it shall no longer be faith but sight. We've just celebrated at Christmas the first appearing, which was quiet, the shepherds, the star, and the manger. His second coming will be with his dazzling warriors from heaven to cope with any situation and to defeat the enemies of God until he has subdued the entire world. Thus, no Christian has the right to go around wringing his hands wondering what we are to do in the face of the present world situation. The scripture says that in the midst of persecutions, confusions, wars, and rumors of wars, we are to comfort one another with the knowledge that Jesus Christ is coming back in triumph, glory, and majesty. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be a series of events transpiring over a rather long period. There are many debates among theologians as to what some of these passages mean. But one thing almost everyone agrees on that loves Christ. It is that Jesus Christ is coming back. When Christ came the first time, he dealt with evil as individual and hereditary. When he comes again, Christ will deal with evil as a practice. He will institute an age of such benevolence that evil cannot reign, and cruelty, oppression, and slavery will no longer exist. All of this will come to pass as a result 
of the personal reign of Christ following his return. Marguerite Higgins, a war correspondent, received the much-coveted Pulitzer Prize for international reporting because of her coverage of the Korean struggle many years ago. She wrote an account of the 5th Company of Marines, which originally numbered 18,000 in their combat with more than 100,000 of the enemy. It was particularly cold, she wrote, 42 below zero that morning when reporters were standing around. The weary soldiers, half frozen, stood by their dirty trucks eating from tin cans. A huge Marine was eating cold beans with his trench knife. His clothes were as stiff as a board. His face covered with a heavy beard was crusted with mud. A correspondent asked him, If I were God and could grant you anything you wished, what would you like most? The man stood motionless for a moment. Then he raised his head and replied, Give me tomorrow. For the true believer in Jesus Christ, the future is assured. Tomorrow belongs to you. We await the distant trumpet announcing the coming of Jesus Christ. The Christian has tomorrow when the kingdom of God shall reign. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank Thee for the tremendous hope we have because Jesus Christ not only lives in our hearts, but He's coming back to this earth again. And all the problems that we see mounting throughout the world are going to be solved by the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to set up His kingdom. We thank Thee for giving us this hope. And we pray that those that have been listening, that know not this hope and do not know Christ, will come to know him as personal Lord and Savior and have the hope of tomorrow in their hearts. For we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When the disciples were sitting on the Mount of Olives, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked three questions. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? What shall be the sign of the end of the age? Matthew, Mark, and Luke differ slightly in their answers, but a condensation of a much longer discussion is probably what we have. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, you can discern the, the weather signs. When it is evening, you say it'll be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning, it'll be foul weather today for the sky is red. Oh, you hypocrites! You can discern the signs of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. And in that parable, Jesus was saying was that in the realm of scientific observation, man is intelligent, but in the realm of spiritual awareness, he's terribly ignorant. And we live in a world of maddening complexity, in an age of doubt and upheaval, in a generation which has lost its bearings, and lost its reference point. And as we scan the face of the contemporary skies, what do we see? Or what do we hear? I listen, and I can hear hoofbeats. The hoofbeats of these four horsemen of the apocalypse that T.W. read a moment ago. And they're getting closer and closer and closer. First, the white horse. What does it stand for? That's not the same as the white horse that we read about in the 19th chapter of Revelation. This is a different white horse. And these same four horsemen are listed in a different form in Matthew 24 in the teachings of Jesus. The first one, the white horse, has to do with false Christ, false religion, a false peace. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many, said Jesus. But there's the true faith being proclaimed throughout the world. And this gospel, he said in the 14th verse of the 24th chapter of Matthew, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. And did you know that for the first time in history, we are almost on the verge of seeing that prophecy fulfilled through the satellites? through the printed page, through radio, through television, through the cassettes. Almost every person in the world today can hear the gospel for the first time. And it's happening in this century, and it's accelerating by the hour as groups all over the world are becoming concerned about reaching those unreached people. And we may see before the end of this century the entire world covered 
with the message of the gospel of Christ for the first time. And it's one of the great signs that his coming may be near. And then the second horse is a red horse. Wars will intensify, Jesus says, and the scripture says. Wars and rumors of wars. Now you take just this century, the 20th century. There began at, at the beginning of this century a new magazine in America called the Christian Century. You see, things were so optimistic in 1900 that they thought they were going to bring in the kingdom. And the church itself was caught up in this, that somehow the kingdom was going to be brought in by us. It wouldn't be brought in by Christ coming, but would be brought in by us making the world so good that Jesus would want to come here again. But it didn't work that way. 1914, war was declared, the first world war that killed more people than any war in history, and then the second world war shortly thereafter, and now 40 more wars going on in the world, and we've had the Korean War and the Vietnam War and all the other wars in the Middle East. The Iraqis and the Iranians seem to be wanting to wipe each other out at the moment. And these wars are going on all over the world. And Jesus indicated that before the end, there will be an intensification of warfare. And that red horse, it seems to me, is standing on the verge of moving across the earth with a war so horrible and so terrible, with new weapons. Now the question comes to me is this, can we hold the horses back? Is there something that we could do that could keep these horses from riding? Yes. Because God was going to judge Nineveh. And it was going to be a terrible judgment upon a city of perhaps a million people or a half million people. And God sent Jonah to preach to Nineveh. And Jonah went up and down the streets of Nineveh and preached repentance and the whole city repented the greatest revival in the history. A city from the king on down repented and God spared Nineveh. The horses that were riding toward Nineveh were stopped and delayed for 150 years. Now these horses are going to ride someday, but they don't have to come in our generation. If we get on our knees before God and repent of our sins and turn to him, I believe these horsemen can be held back. But that's only what I think. It's going to come someday because the scripture teaches that. And then there's the black horse. The black horse always follows the red horse. The black horse is the horse of famine and pestilence. And in the 20th century, Right now, some of the greatest famines of all history are taking place. Now, we took up on Tuesday food for the hungry outside the stadium, and we were told that there was enough food out there to feed the hungry people of Vancouver for two weeks. I hope that you'll keep it up. I think it's a wonderful thing. But who would think in an affluent city like Vancouver, so beautiful, so magnificent, so much wealth, that there would be hungry people? Well, there's hungry people all over America. There's hungry people throughout the world. And that's exactly what that passage of Scripture teaches. The Scripture teaches that when the black horse rides, that there will be the rich and the poor living side by side in the same city, in the same country, in the same community. That's what that passage in Revelation 6 teaches. If you don't believe it, get my book, Hoofbeats. It's in there. And then there's another horse that's going to ride, the pale horse. It's, uh, it comes from a word uh, very much like that we get our word chlorine from. It's a pale green horse. It's the horse of death. And after the four horsemen have run their course, the judgments will have fallen upon the earth. And death and hell will ride together on this horse and this horse will come. And let me say this, people talk about the end of the world to me. Do you know when the end of the world is going to come for you and for me? The moment we die. 
that's the end of the world for you. Think about it. We don't have to wait for a hydrogen bomb. Just wait a few years, or a few months, or a few days, maybe for some of you a few hours, and it'll be the end of the world for you. You go out into eternity in automobile crash, or cancer, heart attack, whatever, and you're gone forever from this earth as far as your own life is concerned. And it can happen so fast. Now, after the four horsemen and before man destroys himself at Armageddon, Christ is going to come. This is going to take place. And you'll never be able to stand and say at the judgment of God, I never heard, nobody ever told me. I've not only told you, I've read it to you out of God's Word. And there are hundreds of people here today that need to repent of their sins and receive Christ into your heart. Because you're not ready to meet God. You're not ready for the end of your world. But you could be ready before this afternoon is over. And this whole crusade might have been held just for you. Because you see, God loves you as though you were the only person in the whole world. You are important to God. God loves you, and he sent his son to die on the cross for you. You see, we had broken God's laws. In the Garden of Eden, man rebelled against God, sinned against God, and he passed that disease of sin to his children, and Cain killed Abel. And then it went on to another generation, and another, 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 down to our generation, and so that all of us are sinners. And the word sin means lawbreaker. We break the moral laws of God. And we're separated from God. Our soul, our spirit that lives inside of us is separated from God by sin. And we're headed toward judgment. And the only way... I believe it's well with her soul. And I trust that before this evening is out, it'll be well with yours also. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, we pray that thy Holy Spirit will apply thy word to our hearts, and we pray that we may come to know Jesus Christ in all of his fullness and all of his power, and that we will follow him to the end of our days. In Christ's name, Amen. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel and these words. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In other words, if the sky is red in the west, it's going to be fair weather. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? You know, when the Pope was visiting the United States, uh, he made this statement on his last day in Washington. He urged a proper interpretation of the signs of the times. A proper interpretation of the signs of the times. Wherever I go in the world, and I, we've done more traveling, I suppose, in the last couple of years than any other time of our ministry throughout the world, on all the continents of the world, and there's a universal feeling that something is about to happen. There's that word in scripture called Maranatha, the password of the early Christians, the Lord coming. And the Bible is filled with references to the second coming of Jesus Christ. 318 times in 260 chapters of the New Testament it's referred to or implied. 23 out of the 27 books of the New Testament it's referred to. All nine authors of the New Testament refer to the coming again of Jesus Christ. The hope that Jesus Christ would someday return to this earth again 
has been one of the great motivating, uh, uh, motivating factors of the early church. Signs that he gave. And see if you think they're coming to fulfillment today in our generation. First he said there will be deceptions. He said, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name saying, I'm in Christ, I am Christ and shall deceive many. I read in the paper the other day that it's estimated in the United States today that there are more than 2,000 people that claim to be Jesus Christ. I think I've met half of them. <laughs> and, and it seems that you can have an instant guru today. You know, you get, a, you get a long robe on and you get you a little following and you say a few words that sound unfamiliar or they sound like some Eastern religion and you can get a following. So there are many deceivers and many false prophets and messiahs today. And Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. Because they are false Christ. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much as if it were possible that even the very elect would be deceived. In other words, it's possible that the most devout Christian might be deceived by some of these people that are coming. And then our Lord said there will be wars and rumors of wars, indicating an intensification of warfare. We've seen in this century two great world wars. We've seen more wars in this century than any other century in the history of the world. And yet this was the century that was supposedly called the Christian century. There was a magazine founded in Chicago called the Christian century at the beginning of this century. And this was to be the Christian century. This was to be the century of peace. The First World War was even fought to save the world for democracy. The Second World War was fought to save the peace of the world, to give freedom to everybody everywhere, Mr. Roosevelt said. And now we stand on the threshold of the most horrible weapons that the mind can conceive. And no wonder the Pope said when he addressed the United Nations that there's a risk that sometime, somewhere, somehow, someone can set in motion the terrible mechanism of total destruction. I read the other day that the editor, one of the editors of McLean's magazine was asked, what frightened him the most? He said the possibility of World War III. And if you've ever had a briefing on the weapon systems today, it's enough to cause the whole world to panic. Because if someone, sometime, somewhere, pushes that button, some terrorist organization, some small country, or a large country, it's all over for millions and billions on this planet. We never dreamed that we would ever reach such a stage in human history, but we're there now, right now. And that's the reason many people are talking about 1984. George Orwell wrote that book, 1984. He wrote the book just after World War II. He died, I believe, in about 1949. But he made 132 predictions of which they now say that over a hundred of those predictions have come true and the other 32 are in the process of fulfillment. And so we're entering the or Orwellian period of human history. And then Jesus said not only would there be an intensification of warfare indicating an arms race and all that goes with the terribleness of war, but he said there'll be famines and there shall be famines in verse 7. Think of what's going on in Cambodia, which people are calling a holocaust. Because thousands upon thousands of people are starving every month to death. It was estimated that last year 64 million people in the world starved to death. Think of it, starving to death in a world in which you and I seemingly have so much. Jesus said, as we approach the end of the age, there will be an intensification of famine and starvation in the midst of plenty. 
and the rich nations grow richer and the poor nations grow poorer and the price of oil you think hits you hard or us hard in the United States think of what it does to a little country with no resources a little country with hardly any exchange at all or any exports at all it's hitting one little country after another and many of them are on the verge of total bankruptcy and, our, and anarchy what that's going to do to our world in the next few years Reverend Michael Maine Bishop Michael ladies and gentlemen it is a great pleasure and joy for me to be back in Cambridge again this brings back uh, wonderful memories of last February when it was my privilege to minister here for eight days and to have the privilege of meeting so many of you. I come back feeling a bit better because last time I came with three broken ribs and uh, this time my ribs are healed but uh, my eyes are a bit heavy because I've been touring Poland and Hungary and just come from Rome and uh, here to Albert Hall on Friday night and uh, then hopefully on the plane tonight, if not tonight, early in the morning. So I do appreciate this privilege, and I think that uh, the Reverend Michael Maine has expressed my own uh, feelings about having this dialogue. Uh, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Bishop Michael. He and I have been friends for 25 years. We reminded each other last night at dinner, and I count it a great privilege to be here today to share this dialogue and fellowship with him and with you. And my prayer is that these few minutes will make it possible for each of us, including myself, to leave Great St. Mary's with a clearer perception of what God's will is for us. There is no more crucial discussion in the world church today than the mission of the church. Today our major concern is not to discuss all the church is called to do, at least it's not mine, or to be. Rather, we are thinking intensely about one segment of the church's task, and that is its outreach around the world. We cannot begin to exhaust this complex subject in the brief time we have here. But because we cannot say everything, it does not mean that we should say nothing. So I start by asking the central question, what is God's purpose for the world? It seems to me as I study the scripture, that God's supreme purpose is to bring all creation under the absolute and final authority of Jesus Christ. Individuals, human society, and even nature itself are destined at last to come under his lordship. God will not permit this rebellious planet to reap the bitter fruit of its rebellion forever. Instead, Christ's rule of perfect justice and peace will be realized. This will only be fully accomplished when Christ comes again. But already God is at work to bring about his kingly rule. The world today is not the way God made it or intended it to be. When he created the world, he pronounced it very good. And yet something went wrong. For the Bible tells us that sin has entered the world and has brought devastation to the whole of creation. Indeed, there is much that we do not understand about the problem of evil and the problem of the devil which the Bible calls the mystery of lawlessness, but we see evidences of it all around us. But this much we do know. Because of sin, which is rebellion against God, all humanity is splintered and torn by confusion and suffering, both on the individual and corporate level. From the very beginning, God warned man that the breaking of his law would result in suffering and death, and every generation has paid and will pay that awful price. But God loves you and me, indeed all of humanity. So he devised his plan for man's salvation and restoration. And that is why Jesus Christ became incarnate. He did not come just to be a moral example, though he was. He came to bring salvation, to reconcile sinful men who were alienated from God. That is what the cross and the resurrection are all about. Jesus himself said in Luke 19.10, that he'd come to seek and to save that which is lost. The Apostle Paul proclaimed in 1 Timothy 1, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So in order to effect our salvation, Jesus Christ voluntarily went to the cross of Calvary. The cross was the most shocking and awe-inspiring event in human history. Yet at the same time, 
It was the most victorious and stupendous happening. It is the cross which makes reconciliation, forgiveness, wholeness, and eternal life possible. What is God doing in the world now? God is doing many things. But most of all, he's establishing his everlasting kingdom. That is why Jesus declared, or James declared in Acts 15, 14, that God is visiting the nations to call out of them a people for his name. God wills that we who name the name of Christ are to renounce forever whatever other gods have occupied first place in our lives, such as materialism, pleasure, power, or whatever. Christ alone must reign as sovereign and Lord. And God has created his church to extend his kingdom. This means that the primary mission of the church is to bear witness to the world by word and deed that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord, and to do it in such a way that his lordship, his kingdom, will be accepted and made manifest among all peoples. However, let me be more specific about our mission. I believe our mission to the world comprises two major elements. They can be comprehended in two words, proclamation and service, kerygma and diakonia. The proclamation of the gospel lies at the very heart of our mission to the world. That is why we must recover the biblical meaning of evangelism in its deepest sense and fullest scope. I realize evangelism is a much misunderstood word and has been invested with many meanings. Personally, I found it excellently defined in the Lausanne Covenant's brief statement, quote, Evangelism is the proclamation of the historical, biblical Christ as Savior and Lord with a view of persuading people to come to him personally and to be reconciled to God. Without proclamation, God's purpose will not come to pass, for without it, humanity will never come to know Christ or to acknowledge him as Lord. There are many methods of evangelism, and we need to be imaginative and innovative. And evangelism is not a calling reserved exclusively for the clergy. I believe one of the greatest priorities for the church today is to mobilize laymen to do the work of evangelism. However, we must never forget that the witness of our lips has limited value unless it is accompanied by the witness of our works. In one of his books, Bishop Michael said something on this subject that I deeply appreciate. He said this quote, it is possible to preach the gospel of conversion without any sight of its social context. It is possible to preach a social gospel which omits the reality of conversion to Christ. Then he advises, be it your wisdom to preach the gospel of conversion, making it clear that it is the whole man with all his relationships who is converted to Jesus as the Lord of all he is and all he does. End quote. Now I must come to the second aspect of our mission, and that is service, diakonia. Just as Christ is the center of our proclamation, he is also the center of our service. He commands our service, and he is an example of it. Jesus declared, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. On one occasion, the crowds, impressed with Jesus' miracles in person, intended to come and make him a king by force, but he refused. Why? It was because he was not coming to dominate and assume worldly power for himself at that time, but to be a servant. To follow Christ is to follow his example of service. There are, I believe, at least two dimensions to our service in the world. The first is that which we render within our own immediate social context. God has placed you in a specific society. And that is true of all Christians throughout the world, for the church is not limited to one culture or social system. I had no choice as to the color of my skin. I had no choice as to what country I was born in. But within the society where God has placed me or where God has placed you, we must first of all be faithful in our responsibilities. Within my own society, the church has often been forced to discover afresh what forms its service for Christ should take. We have in America, for example, had to face the fact of our long tradition of racism is wrong. Christians in America and Britain during the 19th century had a profound influence on the problem of slavery, first working to eliminate the slave trade and then to abolish slavery itself. 
But many were merely content to win the battle over slavery, but did not see the blight of racism that was still with us. In recent decades, God raised up men like Martin Luther King to show us and to lead us, and it has been changing and is still changing. But there's another level of dimension to our service of Christ today. It is what we might call our global role, or our responsibility which extends to the entire human family. More than any previous time in history, the human race is tied together in what has been called a global village. Therefore, those of us who are Christians have a responsibility as Christ's servants to join with others in service within our whole world. I read recently, for example, that an estimated 800 million people live in extreme poverty scattered among many nations. At least 20% of the children born in so-called developing countries die before their fifth birthday. We cannot be complacent in the face of such statistics. This brings me back to proclamation. Proclamation and service go together hand in hand. This is not all of what we mean when we use the word mission in the church today, as I've already said, but it does sum up in my mind our mission to the world.